Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's good to be together. I'm Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School, and I want to welcome you to this Rick and Susan Goings conversation in leadership. Um, we are thrilled to have Arian Moyed with us today and Linda Powell, the chair of the board of the Colin Powell School, um, in conversation with him. So um, the Colin Powell School is the School of Social Sciences here at City College. We're the home of the public service, business, leadership development programs, and we're the largest student division of the college. And we have as our mission, as we say, to transform the world's most diverse student population into tomorrow's global leaders. And it is a mission that came to us from our founder and our namesake, General Colin Powell. It was his wish that he would come back to his alma mater and help us develop the next generation of leaders to serve our society and to serve in every sector. And it's what we do every day. And one of the ways we do it is by bringing distinguished folks who, have, who are already doing that work as leaders to our campus to have conversations about their path. And particularly as we created this series uh, to bring folks who have had in some sense, peculiar, unusual paths, or paths where they have become leaders, but maybe it, would not, it was not expected of them when they, when they began their journeys, because in so many ways that was General Powell's path, and it's the path of so many of our students. And so that's what we're here for today, and I wanna thank Rick and Susan Goings. These were friends of General Powell's. He was the chairman and CEO of Tupperware Brands, and she is the chairperson of the World Youth Federation, and it was their idea uh, soon after General Powell passed to do something in his honor that would really honor what he brought to our world and to do it at the place that he cared about the most. He, he, would, he had said to them, they didn't actually visit campus until after he passed, but as they told me when I met them, he asked them to come 12 times. Uh, and this is what he did with, with many of his friends. So thank you for being here. So we are privileged. This, this, this is the last in this series this year. And this is the second year of the Rick and Susan Goings Conversations and Leadership Series. We started last fall with a session with uh, Bob Roth on Transcendental Meditation and Mindfulness. We had Rick uh, Goings joining us for that conversation. We had Ray Chambers for a conversation about business. Um, we had Christina Jimenez Moreta, who was the founder of United We Dream, to talk about activism and uh, the immigrant rights movement. And we are thrilled to have Arian Moyed with us today, uh, an actor who has uh, been Emmy and Tony Award uh, nominated, someone who has uh, co-founded an award-winning community organizing art and education company here in New York City, and someone who came to this country from Iran at a, at a young age in many, much the same way as many of our students. Linda's gonna do a fuller introduction, but, but, but we're gonna learn much from you and we're so grateful that you're here. Linda Powell, in addition to being chair of the board of the Colin Powell School, is the executive vice president of SAG-AFTRA, the Screen Actors Guild. She is an actress of screen and stage, and she is an organizer and an activist herself, and we're grateful to have her leadership at the school. So. Let me turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Are we on? Yeah. I want to add my thanks to Rick and Susan going. Uh, Susan does a lot of these um, conversations, so I'm, I'm stepping into her shoes, um, which will be easy because Ari and I are friends. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Um, and maybe I can pick your brains about a couple things I don't know about yet. Okay, let's go. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, Ariane Moyed is an Iranian-born Emmy and Tony-nominated actor. He's co-founder of Waterwell, which is an award-winning community organizing art and education company in New York City. As a writer-director, Ariane created the Emmy-nominated six-hour thriller The Accidental War Wolf. He wrote The Courtroom, which premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. Starring Linda Powell. Thank you. That's how we met, we'll get to that. After the critically acclaimed Waterwell performances inside New York City courtrooms, among other places, his current writing projects include 28 More Dad, mm -hmm. uh, The Great Fire of 33, Grandmaster, a film adaptation of The Man in Red, and an autobiography about his family's escape from Iran after the 1979 Islamic Revolution. On stage, he's been seen in A Doll's House, for which he was nominated for a Tony, The Humans, for which he, what? We won. I did not get nominated, but the, the human, show won. Which won, won. a Drama thank Desk you, thank Award. You. Uh, Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, for which he was nominated for a Tony. Nominated, also uh, lost. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep on bringing up the things I one. Uh, Guards at the Taj, for which he won, won an Obie Award. Uh, Love Life, for which he won an We N nominated, nominated, nominated. NAACP nomination. <laughs> TV and film, you've seen him in Spider-Man, No Way Home, Inventing Anna, 
Ms. Marvel, You Hurt My Feelings, House of Spoils, which is upcoming on Amazon, and a little thing called Succession, for which he received an Emmy nomination. <laughs> Always so a silly, bridesmaid. Isn't it? <laughs> no, doesn't matter to me. I was thinking about this the other day, that like, oh, you get upset when you don't win. I was like, win? Like, getting nominated is the win. I mean, it really, the Especially chance. Especially for something like like performing, like yeah. to work a piece of art where it's like, how is one thing better than another or one? It's luck to be in the Total thing luck. that even gets the nomination. And for many immigrants in this room or people that might not know, I mean, the idea that, being born in Iran, escaping, coming here and getting nominated is the win. That's the win. <laughs> like the, it's, oh, I've, I've won like 50 times over, so right. I'm cool. I'd like to see you win, though. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I want to thank Linda Powell. That's the first thing I want to say. Please do. <laughs> Arian and I met when he asked me to be a part of The Courtroom, which was a show that his company, Waterwell, was doing. And um, we did it. It was a, a transcript of an immigration case. Um, and you were drawn to that because of your own story and because of things that were going on in the country. And I want you to talk a little bit about coming here as a young person, starting Waterwell, and the journey to the type of works that Waterwell um, ended up doing and the mission that you guys have. Because when I, when I called Ari and I said, I want you to do conversations in leadership, were you surprised? Are, are people constantly calling you a leader now? Because like, like Andy said, it's, it's, we come to this in peculiar ways. I know I've come sideways into Same. the places I yeah. find myself now. I mean, yeah, when, when Andy was speaking and you said leader, and I, was, I, and I think about like leaders in my brain, most, I don't think I like came to New York or America, I'm like, I'm gonna be a leader. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just doesn't kind of work that way. I mean, my immigrant, Iranian immigrant experience is very common and very peculiar. Um, I am a, I am the fourth child of um, two amazing human beings. Um, I was, you know, an accident that that wasn't supposed to happen. But my, it was. I have two brothers and a sister that are 17, 18, and 19 years older than me. And during the revolution, as one brother is fighting in the Iran-Iraq War, and one brother is in Chicago going to school and my sister's basically getting arrested, you know, on the streets of of Tehran. I'm protesting. Bored. What's that? Your sister's protesting? Protesting against, you know, basically everybody. Um, and so it was that chaotic kind of turn and then all of a sudden I'm born. Um, and um, and it was very clear to my family that it wasn't just and we weren't of a class to like pick up and leave. Do you know what I mean? Most people that could leave left in right. 79 78, 79, but we weren't of that class. And so we just kind of like meandered our way and got to Dubai and we lived there for a bit and got to Chicago where my brother was at. And at that point, I was, it was 1986, I was like six years old and uh, my brother had been in the States for 10 years and, and it was starting anew again because um, my parents had no concept of what English was or what America was, but they knew that Iran wasn't going to work. And so those early years um, were just messy. Iran, not that it's like some sort of beacon of, you know, you know, news that people like put it in a, in a, in a great light. But back then it was just rough being Iranian. And so coming off the heels of the hostage situation, Iran-Contra, um, the bombing and uh, of, of it. There was all this stuff that was going around. And so growing up with two parents that spoke very little English and, and it was, and it was labeled to us that we were Iranian was kind of like the empathy building kind of uh, start of it all. We lived in, a, uh, in an apartment complex in the north suburb of Chicago that was all black, brown and, and, and immigrants that lived in a very rich neighborhood. And, and, and though my parents had no means, and my mom was working so many jobs, mostly in childcare, um, every night I'd come home from the bus, come home to school, and there'd be some like random immigrant family at our house. And I'd be like, mom, who the hell are these people? And they're like, oh, they just came here, and we're gonna give them dinner. And I was like, mom, oh my god. <laughs> but that was just the energy. That was just kind of like the vibe. Um, we can label that whatever you want, but at the time, my mom was trying to build community where she had none. That kind of empathy building and that kind of itinerant lifestyle, to me, also is a very much an 
actor training. Yeah. An actor building kind of upbringing. I agree with you. you know? I agree with you. I mean, and 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 I I I'm 43 years old. I'm looking back at that time. I think what was happening was I found a niche of like making my family laugh that again this is subconscious i wasn't purposefully doing this as a young kid but i think what was happening is i would watch the movies that my parents liked which were movies that they saw when they were kids which was charlie chaplin sound of music you know fiddler on the roof like that's the shit that my parents cared about and i'd like mimic that and kind of like loosen the tension in the immigrant household of like no money no you know all that stuff and so that well, well, and then I grew, and then I grew up in this really rich neighborhood. Even though we lived literally on the other side of the highway, at this rich neighborhood, they have arts programming, a lot right. of it. They have stuff for arts, and they say, "Hey, come over here and do more art, and come over here and make a play or make a this." And it wasn't a thing. And you have to imagine in my immigrant household, that was what America was. It was just like, oh, you, everyone gets art, and everyone gets ESL classes. I was in ESL until fourth grade, so, like, and that's what I grew up with. And really, those things kind of meshed in my DNA. And then 9/11 happened. And I was in Indiana University, and 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 really, I didn't imagine. To be amazingly honest, I didn't imagine a career in film and television. I imagined a career in like regional theater because there was nobody for me to look at to be like, oh, I want to be Tom Cruise. I want to be whatever, whoever that person is or whoever that lady might be. And so, and so in my mind, I kind of was like, oh, I'm just gonna do regional theater. And then, and then we moved to New York and Tom and I, after the heels of 9-11, to be real with you, all we kept on thinking about was Tom's all Tom's your buddy from school. Tom Ridgely is the co-founder of Waterwell. We went to Indiana together and he, he's a, you know, he's an Indianapolis kid and the two of us had no, <laughs> we had no business being in New York really. And that's the only way to come. That's the only way. We had nobody. <laughs> we had nobody. There's no Indiana University Alumni Association that's pumping. There was no Iranian American blah 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 association. No showcase. No showcase. None of it. But we just knew and I know this sounds crazy, but at the time, and I still believe this, and our mission statement said that in 2002 when we formed Waterwell, that 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 the we can do service to the world with art. We believe and still believe that one of the major engines of change is art. I still believe that. There are two things that are left in history, and those are the wars that we fight and the art that we make. That's it. That's all we have. And so two 22-year-olds started throwing around words that weren't like in the vocabulary in the theater scene at that time. Empathy, accessibility, responsiveness. And people thought we were crazy. I'm being honest with you. But that's the thing I'm curious about, is yeah. that, that seed of that idea. Do you think that was watching your mother? Do you think it was from the programs you took at school? Do you think it was an inborn sense that Arian has about right and wrong and, and service to the world? Or was there someone that you saw doing something like it that inspired you guys? All of that, I think, really, to be, you know, it's a mix of all those things. You know, again, when you're 22, some, maybe some 22-year-olds. One you, or two. You, one or two. <laughs> you don't know what is going on, to be honest with you. You're just kind of like winging it. But, um, and that's just, which is beautiful, which is the most beautiful thing about the, that time. And at that time period, I guess the training that we had, the books we were reading, the experiences that we had, were really leaning towards art as a change tool. I, I remember, I remember, I remember reading. Um, you know, I read in my freshman year. I read Alex Haley's, you know, Malcolm X biography, and I'm reading this thing, and I'm feeling a lot of things about this. And as at the end of this book, I'm seeing that he's realizing more and more things about what it means to be a human being on top of everything else. And I just was gravitated towards that. We gravitated to the teachings of Gandhi, and we just read those things. But then we also loved Julie Taymor. And we read The Empty Space, with Peter Brook's Empty Space. And Empty Space is not about how to become a famous actor. It's about a rug is all you need to make art. 
And then we were reading Peter Brook um, was doing uh, theater in Iran in 1974 about Iranian art. I was just like, oh my God, mind alter. And, so, and that was the engine. And I want to say 9-11 was a big engine. How so? Because all of a sudden, it became very clear that I was Iranian. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like immediately, it's like, oh, you are on that team. And the other thing is, most people have no clue what it means to be Iranian or Middle Eastern. I don't know anything about farming. I don't know anything about uh, a lot of things. But if you don't give them the art to understand what it means to be a farmer or Iranian, and only have the, 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 the preconceived notions that we've seen, then all we're gonna get is that. And, and, and at that time period, we, Tom and I, and myself included, were really adamant that like, oh my God, they don't realize that the majority of Middle Easterners are just regular, boring people that are trying to put food on a table and trying to get from place A to place B and trying to have a little bit of a society and all of a sudden all of this stuff was going to unleash and which it did and, and, and that we're kind of like in right now and, and, and art to us was the tool that we had to tell people we are citizens and human beings first um, and I still believe that. That's where I was going to go. Yeah. It's, it's, it sounds like a very 22-year-old, <laughs> yeah. idealistic, let's do this. And, you know, everybody in college is a liberal. By the time you get your 40, you're a Republican. Um, how do you hold on to believing that things are possible as a, as a leader of your company, as an artist in the world, um, when you and I both know how often you you are exposed to the opposite, or how often your company runs into issues where you're not getting the feedback you want, you're not getting the funding you need, you have to fight to keep your staff paid. How do you find the resources to have that, you know, beginner's mind stay alive and have that, um, there's something idealistic about the mission. Yeah. And it, there has to be, idealism in the world <laughs> or else we're doomed. How do you keep it alive for yourself and for your institution? Booze. <laughs> <laughs> no, um. <laughs> I mean, you are hitting on something that's so real and so powerful and so every organizer way more, you know, it, you know, um, with a lot more breath than I have has gone through the things that y you're talking about. Um, I have I have to believe two things that this that the, the 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 change that we want to make is not a light switch that's going to turn on and off. It's a fader that's going one level up. So my goal is not to by the end of it, uh, you know, when I'm dead and buried, or you know, it is is not to turn on the light switch. I stop believing in that. I don't believe that that is how th the wheels of progress do move slowly. They just do. And so that's one portion of it. And the other is, you know, it's happening now. There's so much shit that's happening at Waterwell right now that's like really kind of like a sizable moment for a 20 year organization, you know? And, 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 and the community brings us together. The craft brings us together. Um, we can call it idealism, but the mission brings us together. And, and, and we have to believe in those things. Otherwise, not to say that we're like so dogged, like, it's like this is the only way that this is gonna have to happen. You have to adapt and move and move forward. You know, We used to, as 22 year olds, be like, we're gonna change the world. But like those, wor those words were lofty and big, but those are not the exact tools that we need anymore. We don't need to change the world. Like I said, it needs to be a fader. So we are always adapting and moving, but the obstacles are tough. Waterwell has a massive education program in um, New York City. Um, uh, we run a, a DOE school called the Professional Performing Arts School on 13th Street. We have 240 students. One of our students, uh, one of our, um, someone that's here, uh, uh, their daughter has gone to our school. And, and we have 250 kids a year. We teach this thing called the Artist as Citizen. It's grade six through seven. It's completely free. I can talk about that all day. But um, as you're doing these things, one of the students that came to my, that graduated, I don't even know when, let's say 2015, came to my office and um, 
and has gone through college after graduating our high school program and is like, how do I find, and I'm gonna cry, I was like, how do I find those moments to know that I'm doing the right thing as an artist? Which is a question we ask ourselves, even now. How do I know that I'm doing the right thing? How do I know that I'm you know, moving and I should be doing this? And sadly, there is no answer to that because, we, because that question never ends. We know this because we work with famous people. Yeah. Who are famous <laughs> They're people. asking the same questions. They're like, how do I get is. out? No? <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. And, and the answer to that question is community. It is craft. It is the love of others. It's hard work. And, 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 and if you work hard and, and you go after those things and, you, and, and, and I feel that you feel like those things, whatever the path is, it will work out because it's whatever it's gonna be a famous actor or like a producer. Um, and I can't say that to, it was a he, I can't say that to Sam. And, and, but at the same time, I know that we have to surround ourselves and move past these things. That's the first part. And the second part is a selfish thing I just wanna say, is that my family escaped Iran, came to this country with zero dollars, had no business understanding. Imagine the grocery store for the first day. Just imagine, just like looking at the grocery store and being like, what do I buy here? Nothing is impossible. Yeah. No, you know, people ask me, how do you have so many, how do you juggle so many things? How much, how do you get all this stuff done? First of all, it's not me. It's a group of people, you know this. Mm -hmm. It's not me, the, the, the courtroom is a million amazing human beings. And the second thing is, to be honest, none of this was hard as being an immigrant. It just wasn't. That was harder. And so to me, the word impossible or no is just so weird to me. What's him? You know, I mean, there are roadblocks, there are obstacles. Obviously, we've had them. People will say no. <laughs> you know, I get it. They will? But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, we performed the courtroom with Linda's brilliant performance. Um, at the Thurgood Marshall Courthouse of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, everybody, you could imagine, said, no way that this theater company is performing this show here. Well, I guess so, I guess it can happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we had to meet a lot of people, there was a lot of obstacles along the way, but you know, I think that truth set us free. And so I have a feeling that, that, that the impossible is, is, is just not something that I'm very interested in, you know? And I think, I mean, I'm just gonna sidetrack for a second because what you said just resonated with me and I thought, and I myself am second generation Jamaican parents on one side, Jamaican grandparents on one side who were immigrants and uh, seamstress and a shopkeeper and two generations removed from slavery on the other side. Look at us, Irene. Yeah, I mean, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that that resonates for a lot of the students in this room who come from, I, I, I remember when I first got involved with this school, I went to Women Mary and all I had to do was go to school and sometimes I went to class and sometimes I didn't, I did a lot of theater and it was, a, it was fun. And I hear sometimes the stories of the students here and the, the hurdles they have to go through to make sure they get to class, to make sure that they can afford to be here, to make sure that um, they have enough extra to get on the subway to get to school. Not all of our students, but I mean, we're 80% black and brown, first in their family to go to college. So I think what you're saying is such a good answer to that question for this room, you know? I, 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 I get energy off of that. I get energy off of that. To me, all of a sudden, we can all accomplish anything now. Because to me, going through that, I can't imagine what it must be like to be a black woman living in this society, to be honest with you, I can't. But imagining getting to this place right here is so powerful to me. It's so inspiring to me. And those stories are the stories that I think are, are the championing stories that art can put out there. And, um, I have nothing else to say. I want you to talk. I want you to talk about some of the some of the work that Waterwell's done. Um, you talk a little bit. Of, we've yeah. talked about the courtroom, but if you could kind of describe what it was, yeah. talk about the Flora stuff. Talk about talk about your stuff. Um, I talked a little bit about the education side. If anyone's more interested, please let us know. We can talk 
for ages about it. That program um, is 13th year right now. The Artist of Citizen is the kind of the training that we do. That kind of training tells you that we're gonna teach you how to become world-class artists through really rigorous arts training, vocal technique, acting, um, all of it, theater history. But we teach you none of that matters unless you better the communities that you care about. And communities is a big word. I don't care what your community is. And I say this because some 17-year-old kid doesn't want to talk about immigration. They want to talk about gaming. Cool. Let's talk about gaming. I remember, you know, in the 2000s, there were auditions for Middle Easterners to come in to audition for like some of these gaming, you know, I don't know what the game was, but like these shoot 'em games or whatever, where like Middle Easterners die, and they wanted us to audition for Middle Easterners dying and how we would die in an audition. It's like, okay, so we die differently. <laughs> so when we get shot, like other words come out or something. So, so that community, I said this to this kid, that community can be fixed. <laughs> that's a community that you can give a shit about. And so that's on the education side. On the production side, yeah, the courtroom in 2018, when there was all that crazy shit was happening on the border, um, I was in Chicago doing a play at Steppenwolf uh, called Guards of the Taj. I was with my mom. My mom came home watching Fox News. She was, um, and, and, and she's crying. And I'm looking at her like, is everything okay? And she goes, oh my God, look at these kids. You're all, all in Farsi. Look at these kids. And I said, it's going to be devastating for them in Farsi. If there's almost that. That's when they were separating families? Yeah, separating families. Um, um, and then my mom said, it's going to be, a, it's devastating for the United States. And my mom loves the United States more than any person in this room <laughs> combined. <laughs> and when my mom says that, I was like, ah. So I called the organization, um, the board chair now, and, and I was like, we need to talk about this. And, and somehow or another, I was interested in reading transcripts of deportation cases. And within, I guess, like three or four weeks, I was reading um, Richard Haynes's, um deportation case of this one woman by the name of Elizabeth Keithley, who came here on a K-1 visa legally, and at the DMV was asked not if she wanted to register to vote. She shouldn't have been asked that question. She is not a citizen of the United States. But she was asked that question, and because she thought that America is a place where voting matters, she was enthusiastically saying, yes, I would love to vote. They send her a registration card. They shouldn't have done that. Her husband did not know any better. Was like, I guess they validated you, and you should vote. So she votes. And at her green card test, when they ask her if you can, did you ever vote, she says yes. And they tore up her case, put her in deportation case, and then they deported her. And we had the transcripts for the first trial, that was an immigration court, the transcripts for the second trial, which went to the Seventh Circuit. Seventh Circuit. Uh, Seventh Circuit, oh my God, if I said this wrong, please don't, uh, don't at me, as the kids say. Uh, Seventh Circuit in Chicago, and this very conservative judge in the second cir Seventh Circuit uh, overturned it and made precedent and first impressions. We took that store, those transcripts, Lee Sunday Evans, the real kind of like mastermind behind it all, who's the artistic director of Waterwell. She took those transcripts, we dug down, we had some rehearsals, but not many rehearsals because we wanted it to be so raw and we performed them in only courtrooms in New York City. And it was just the transcripts. There was no, never, no, you know, dramatic text. It was just one time the we, transcript. We, because DHS was said like seven times in a row, one time we took it and said Department of Homeland Security, just so like for clarity's sake, but nothing other than that. And we edited it down to exactly what it needed to be. We performed them completely free of cost all over New York City, and it became a huge stink, mostly not in the theater community, in the immigration rights community. And I, when I say that the entire immigration rights community, especially immigration court reform, came and saw that show from San Francisco to New York City, I'm telling you, everybody came. And that has led to, I would say, six to 10 separate projects that we've done with immigration folks, including the Flores exhibits, flores-exhibits.org, which are 69 sworn testimonies of children on the border that are just read testimonies that are now video testimonies that you can get online. Law schools are using them on how to take proper testimony. Um, we, during the election time, Waterwell, under Lee's guidance, worked in 18 different um, places all across the city and like 
perform these on Zoom during the pandemic. Um, we've talked about the florist exhibits. We have worked with, um, we've made, anyway, I can- What's the stuff you did on the Intrepid with? During the 2000s, when Tom and I were kind of like winging it, we were pretty anti-war, but our work is not polemic. Our work is not, I will say something about all of our work, including the courtroom. It's not like a liberal show. I don't think that show is liberal. I don't think that show is conservative. Um, but I don't think that show is liberal. And our work doesn't deal with that. I don't, the truth has a way of entering your system and making you complicated, and that's exciting. And that's a water well trait. We were pretty anti-war at that time period, and we did a show called The Persians, which is Aeschylus' first play. We never had to say anything about the war, we just did the play. And Tom and I were gonna apply for our first grant. We're 25 years, it's a true story. 25, 26 years old, we're applying for our first NEA grant, National Endowment of the Arts. When I say we have no idea what we're doing, I just want you to imagine we have no idea what we're doing. But we are a nonprofit. Our first show was $200. Our seventh show was 5,000? I have no idea. So we applied, but then one day reading the newspaper, we were re read that there was this, it was 2006, staggering 29 uh, service men and women were committing suicide a day. And all of a sudden, Tom and I are like, 29, is that right? That sounds like a cuckoo number. And you start digging in, and that's a real number, 2006. And then the next question is, who are veterans? Who are veterans? And they're black, and they're brown, and they're poor. That's majority. Yes, you have some legacy, but they're black, brown, and poor. Now all of a sudden, you're th looking at these, these, and then we read uh, uh, this, this unbelievable, you, anyway, I don't want to go too deep into that. We made a commitment at 25, 26 years old that it's not the fault of these black, brown, and poor folks that have to fight this war or fight any wars. We should make all of our shows free for veterans. So we wrote a grant to the NEA saying just that. And guess what? They accepted you it. You crazy kids. <laughs> and then all of a sudden we're like, oh my God, what do we do? <laughs> and that has led to about 16 or 17 years of really deep relationships with, I would say, a dozen or so veteran organizations in New York City, um, Blue Star families, uh, Gold Star families. And, and, and that relationship led to a lot of different shows and ideas and depth. And we found these old music musicals that were commissioned by the War Department in 1944. Um, um, and they were, just hear this out, just so you can hear this. The War Department commissioned artists to make four musicals to be performed by active duty service men during World War II to deal with their shock trauma. Think about this. They said, let them make theater after they kill some Nazis, so let them release their trauma. The War Department, those performances were never performed. It took 72 years. We found those. We took out all the racist and sexist shit. We put them on the Intrepid, and we had a cast of 60 people, half of which were veterans. Half of them were dealing with severe PTSD, and for the first time, the Department of Defense got to actually fulfill their mission of making art by service men and women 72 years later. I didn't know that story. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, a, I mean, it was huge. <laughs> so 70 <laughs> actors on the Intrepid. Um, it was, and it was a crazy time. The inauguration was a week later for Trump. A lot of people had obviously thoughts about that. Um, a lot of people on stage had thoughts about that. They're probably not similar to mine, but it didn't matter because a community of people came together and made it happen. So that was the that was called the Blueprint Specials. There's a documentary on American theater that you can watch on it. Um, that you know, I can talk about. That. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna open up to questions in a minute. Um, we got about 20 minutes left. Yeah. I um, let's talk a little bit about your career. No <laughs> um, I read somewhere that in the very, when you were like a baby actor, you were still a very picky baby actor. Yes. Like you had an agent, you were busy telling your agent, no, I won't do that, I won't yeah. do this, I won't do that. Um, yeah. Was that about the stereotypes you refused to engage in? Yeah, I mean, 
2005, six, that show, again, a lot of the stuff, just to give you an idea of why we teach this kind of like artist citizen work, is that that show, The Persians, that was a small little show at under St. Mark's, who anyone knows that it's like a rat infested, amazing theater on the Lower East Side. Um, moved to an off-Broadway house. I got signed by William Morris, and which is a huge agency for those that might know. I'm 25, 26 years old. And, and I kind of made it a priority that I wasn't gonna do terrorist roles or victim roles. Because my really family cuts it down at that time. Well, I didn't work because <laughs> there's no rules. Um, prior to succession, I I don't think I, I could think of one or two jobs where I didn't have an accent. Total, literally, like I always had an accent, um, and I said no to those things. And I just thought it would be embarrassing to the to the 1.4 billion Middle Easterners and Muslims that are not involved with terrorists, terrorism. And I said, I'm not doing those things. And I will tell you, it was, now it's very, it feels cool to say that out loud. Um, but at the time, it felt powerful, it felt strong, it felt isolating, it felt scary, it felt like I was gonna have a, a, a life in the theater. Uh, which is fine. Worst things could happen. Worst things can happen. Uh, just no money. Uh, <laughs> but along the way, I just kept on saying no, and I just kept on saying that it doesn't really matter. And and then I did this show on Broadway called The Bengal Tiger at the Baghdad Zoo, starring myself and Robin Williams. I played an Iraqi translator, um, and we were the two leads of this show. And And... I got nominated for Surrounding to get nominated for a Tony Award. And after that show ended, um, I was emboldened to stick with that path. And to be real with you, I, I, the, I just started giving even less of a shit about what they thought. And to be real, the moment that that happened, I never stopped working. I really yeah. just, I come into those rooms, even if they want me for something that's really, you know, what the, the, the thing that they say is, it's a terrorist, but he's got a heart of gold. Like, he's, <laughs> he, he's doing it for revenge because they killed his family. And then, and then you have to like, and then, and then they, they don't want to just hear no, they really want you, so they're like, no, tell us why, or help us fix it. Or the, and then you have to say stuff like, listen, my brother fought in the Iran-Iraq war for two years. My first cousin, Hamid, died in that war. I didn't get a chance to really even meet him. I was so young. You know who I don't want dead? Iraqis. Why? Because that's insanity. <laughs> it's insanity to think that we want to have everyone dead because my father was killed by an American ba 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 ba. We have to realize that not all of our things are based on freaking revenge. It's insanity. If it were, we'd all be dead. There's 1.75 billion Muslims. Come on, leave me alone with that stuff. And, and it's hard to say no because Homeland was a huge show that was winning all of the awards. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh yeah, no, I said no for two years in a row. <laughs> and then Argo wins an Oscar. You're like, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah, those things happen. But I would say history bends like a fader towards the truth. And, 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 and I, I don't mean to dog anyone that's done those things. I have no, you know, I have so many Middle Eastern friends that are trying to, you know, they're, 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 they're trying to make their coin. They're trying to make their mail. Like, I get it. Like, do whatever you need to do to make your money. I'm not judging you. But for me, it was too far. And, and, and I'm going to be real. If I did say yes to those things and played a bunch of terrorists, I'd never be on succession. Yeah. You, there'd be no chance I'd even get an audition. Because they'd be like, even if they came in and be like, this guy's a great actor. He does mostly terrorists. It's like, <laughs> all right, well, we're in boardrooms. So again, I'm not trying to, you know, it's, that's how the, I mean, that's how it works. Um, yeah. so, so it's even, yeah. So that pickiness led to, you know, some of these things happening. And, and it's hard because along the way, you were like, holy shit, did I make a mistake? 
did I make an error? And I have kids. Like, like, am I not putting bread on the table because of these things? But again, I just think that there's th that 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 all of the stuff that I've said. Also, I don't want my mom to see me saying that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. My my parents have, have done so much. You know. We talk in the union a lot about. Um trying to increase representation, trying to get more diversity in storytelling. Um, it's a fader. And, and, and while there is a lot more um, employment, I'm not sure there's as much diversity of representation in the storytelling as there could be. You're right. Are you finding that um, there's, I'm sure because of the success you had, people are now looking for you. Sure. You know, people yeah. are coming to you with stuff, and they, it's not necessarily a Middle Eastern role. It's a role for Aryan. Yeah. But what do you think, looking at the landscape, are things getting better from when you were mainly turning down things? I mean, the fader is a, a slow-moving fader. <laughs> um, are they getting better? I have to believe that they are. Are they... Are they anywhere near where they need to be? Not even close. Mm. The reality is, is that is systemically, for whatever industry that you're in, it has to start with leadership. It has to start with some of us having, not just being represented on screen, but being represented in the executive boardroom. And to me, um, that those are the next steps. And and then, to, you know. Again, I know nothing about farming. Uh, let me demystify one story about like um, a, 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 an episodic show. An episodic show, like a law show, whatever that law show is to you. Every year they have to do 22 episodes. And every year there's 10 writers. And every year, at the beginning of the year, they're looking at the newspapers and they're like, there's gonna be a story on this, 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 and this. And then all of a sudden, you're gonna get three stories, I'm gonna get three stories, you're gonna get three stories, and then we're gonna have to make these three stories. Now one of these three stories, I'm gonna go back to farming, I have, is farming which I know nothing about. I know nothing about farming. So what am I gonna do? I, I wanna keep my job. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do some Googling on farming. I might call someone that has like a garden and I might like ask a couple of things about like seeds and like, I'm just being real, like this. And then all of a sudden, two weeks later, my script is due. And then I'm gonna put that script, and I'm gonna put that script out. And then that script is going into production. And then three weeks later, we're shooting or whatever, timeline, whatever. That's what happens to any other. So imagine if your episode is the Iran episode. Imagine if you're a white dude writing a, 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 an episode about a, a black woman. Do you see what I'm saying? And so unless we are at a place at the executive level to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Which if writers get into the room? Which stories get picked? Yeah. And say, oh, you want to do a farming episode? Hold on a second. You need to go deep. <laughs> Waterwell has this thing, depth over breath. Stop trying to grab everybody. Just try to do the thing great and then move on. So if you're doing the farming episode, maybe the executive should say, you know what, Linda, you're not getting other scripts. We'll still pay you. You're not going to do two other scripts. You're going to do the farming episode. And you, I need you to get this right. So give this to me in three months. Then all of a sudden, you can go to, I, I, again, I'm just, you, you would go deep. You, uh, your task would be to go deep. And, and, and that won't happen unless there is a big systemic change at the top. We did, Waterwell did a Hamlet that was set in 1917 Tehran. It was both in English and in Farsi. And um, at that time period in Iran in 1917, all the British were coming in and they wanted to, you know, do their thing. And um, as they're doing their thing, a lot of people are like, oh, well, maybe if we make English the certain language, maybe we'll get more British money, right? And so we did this play where Hamlet is actually trying to Americanize or whatever, you know, be more British. And as you're doing this, and you're going down this thing, you then and then the ghost comes in. The ghost only speaks in Farsi, and then he goes back and only speaks in Farsi. And then you see people see the show that know nothing about Iran, zero, and they say to us, "Every person in America should see this play, because I don't think they know that Iranians have this type of history." And the reason is is not that it's just prejudice and ignorant. It's just that no one is telling these stories. The only stories that you're seeing are the stories that are where, you know, 
a terrorist or we're about to be a terrorist or we're a terrorist with a heart of gold, you know? And unless we go all the way up there and say, no, stop, yeah. stop, 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 you know? And that is, that That's is a fader. A fader. <laughs> Unless someone here wants to give Waterwell $50 million. We'll do all those stories. $50 million. Um, any questions? Questions, anybody? Because we can keep talking. Um, over here and then over here after. Hi. My name is Peter Goodman. Hey, Peter. I'm also an IU graduate. I got my master's at IU. and I Let's go Hoosiers. Yes. Um, I was sitting with some friends, some of whom are actors, and they were bemoaning the fact that as they get older, they still can't make a living in the theater. They get hired all the time, they're working all the time, but they simply can't make a living. And they were wondering at what point do they simply find a career where they could support their family. Did you ever have the same challenges? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question is a big one. I think it's a it's it's we we don't value the arts in this country. We don't value people that do the arts in this country. We don't help people. We think of them as um, outsiders or people that are trying to like do some sort of like weird narrative. Um, the answer to your question is um, those zeros that you're talking about are always the case. Meaning, I have friends of mine that you would imagine are gajillionaires, famous Oscar nominated, winning, whoever, that are also dealing with money problems because we don't value the arts in this country. And so to answer your question, um, uh, I, I c there is no answer to your question because there, there's no way I can tell any artist. The constant gut check. The constant gut check. That being said, and I say this as, 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 and I mean this, I still think that the value that we bring to society is something that is really meaningful. I read this, or I maybe saw this clip that Ethan Hawke talked about, where, where like, why does art matter? Well, we only use art, remember wars and art, we only use art in these most tragic of situations. We read poetry at a memorial. We sing, we read poetry, uh, um, or we, we read, that's the value of this. So sadly, I don't think that I can ever say to any artist, well, I hope to goodness that you can make all of your bread making this, you know, as a career. But the fulfillment, the spiritual fulfillment is the reason why we come back. Linda and I just did a play. We just were on, you know, we've done plays all our whole lives. Plays don't make money. <laughs> they just don't. But, we, but the, the satisfaction and the feeling of entertaining someone of making feel feel making feel making an audience member say, "Oh my gosh, you remind me so much of my blank," is is the spiritual reward that you know doesn't obviously put you know food on the table, but is why you have friends that are still grinding at whatever age they're at. Right here. Uh, hi. Thank you for. This discussion was super interesting. So yeah, I'm a visitor in America, and uh, I'm a European um, immigrants in Finland. Uh, I organized a theater group, so I was teaching theater in a foreign language at the university. And uh, I found your project super interesting because I'm trying to help immigrants uh, socialize with Finnish people who are very shy people, have some difficulties with immigrants, etc. But one issue that I had is often uh, refugees who arrive in Finland uh, don't talk neither English nor Finnish. And so I was wondering, did it ever happen to you that you had cases where you want to do projects with people but you cannot communicate? How do you deal with these kind of situations? Uh, great question. Um, Two things I want to say. Uh, one is the United States is a little bit different because we could we have access to more, especially in New York City, access to more languages. So we have access to more people that can help out. Um, in a situation like that, which I don't know, again, I don't know much about Finland, I don't know what refugees you're speaking of, I can imagine many. Uh, immediately, if that situation um, were in kind of like our kind of like pocket, let's say, um, I would immediately try to find partners. 
I would try to find community partners. I would try to find partners that wouldn't just be in Finland, be all over. There's groups that we know, maybe you even know about these, that Jessica Hecht is running down in, um, in Greece that's working with like refugees down there. I would try to find other organizations to try to like help find those things and really like piecemeal those things together. Um, I would also say if language is a huge barrier and you have one language that you guys really need help with, I, I, I would raise, again, this is, this is how I would attack this, you know, um, this um, uh, little, you know, road bump, is that I would, I would try to find and bring over as many of those artists as possible, because the reality is that it's not a roadblock. It's not going to, it's, not, it's just something that you have to get over. You know, so I would try to bring more and more partners and people. But it does happen. We during the pandemic, this organization that we work with called uh, Documented, an amazing organization that works with immigration and immigration rights. They, you've met them a few times. They've done a lot of stuff with the courtroom and other stuff that we've done. Um, Documented was really concerned about the undocumented Spanish-speaking. Um, uh, workers in Queens because so many of them are working, you know, deliveries and now they have no opportunities for anything. And um, so we had to seek out someone that's a Spanish speaking director to kind of help make a, a, a film with us. And so part of it is taking that ego away and making it's not, not that you're having that, but just finding all of those partners to get involved and getting buy in. And, and can I say something? There's a saying, you know, if you build it, they will come. You know, someone just recently said, oh, you guys seem like you've known each other for 20 years. It's because we're, we're actually the same kind of artist, which is the same kind of artists that have been around since Aeschylus' time and prior. And so you just have to find us. <laughs> you have to find that community. Um, and that's kind of how I would say that. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. You just have to find people that are doing this. And, and, and can I say this to everyone out there? They're waiting for your email. <laughs> Am I right? They are waiting for you to call them. When, 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 and I'll tell you, immigration rights, veteran rights, labor rights. When, when we did a show about um, labor organizers before our strike called Seven Minutes, when we quick reached out to labor uh, notes and all these, they were hoping for, they were like, where have you been? Do you know what I mean? And that's because nobody reaches out to them because they feel ostracized or feel like no one cares. So I promise you, you put, a, I, you put five feelers out, you'll get four calls back. You'll get four calls back. Um, hi, um, right here. <laughs> oh, there you go. Hey. Yeah. Uh, um, my name is Sumaya. I'm a senior creative writing here. Um, and I have a, one question. I'm curious for you. What is it about the craft of theater that can affect social change? There is one, I think, better, there's no better tool to exercise the muscle of empathy than theater. You're an artist, an actor's job is for you to care about Stewie Hussein in this character play on Succession. My job is to make you care about this character. I could be evil, I could be bad, I could be good, whatever word you wanna do. And that transference of empathy between an audience, that unspoken energy between an audience and a performer is the tool of social change right there. Because if less we don't hear about stories from every one of our stories and understand what it's like, we're never going to get further. We're only just gonna to go towards the war and less to the art. So someone asked like, well, it is the artist of citizen training. It includes acting classes, vocal classes, movement classes. It includes um, theater history, literature, calls devising, artist as citizen. And yes, it's acting training, but you can imagine how many immigrants and, and black and brown folks whose parents, or even white folks whose parents know nothing about the theater are coming to our school. And you can imagine as they're coming into the school, we have to tell them, we're gonna tell them they're gonna be great actors, but we're not telling them we're gonna be famous. We're telling them, listen, it's all kind of a ruse anyway. Whatever happens, 
if they become actors or not actors, what's gonna happen to them is they are going 100% to be able to come up into a room, stand in front of you, empathize with other people, hear your story, listen, and move on. And that transference is the tool that we need. And it's easy because it doesn't cost anything. Right now, Linda and I can jump up here and do a show for you. It doesn't cost anything, you know? And, 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 and what show are we doing? <laughs> um, but the, the, yeah, so, and, and in that respect, hearing other people's stories is the key. It really is the key. And you know, I did this show recently on Broadway called A Doll's House. Some people just saw it here. And I play this character in A Doll's House called Torvald. I don't know if anyone knows this play, but Torvald is considered in our community like one of the evil men on earth. He's one of the evil characters ever written in evil times. I have not, I didn't really know the play. I didn't really see, I've never seen the play and everyone's telling me this. Oh my God, he's evil, he's evil. Okay, fine. I cannot go in saying, okay, I'm gonna play evil because no person on earth wants to see that. No one wants to see me twirl my mustache. And everyone is saying, oh, Torvald usually hits Nora at the end of this play, right? And I've hear, I'm hearing this and I'm like, oh, well, the moment I, as a Middle Eastern man, hit Jessica Chastain on stage, things are gonna change. First, forget all the Middle Eastern stuff for a second. Every man in the room is going to look at that and say, oh, well, I'm not him. I don't hit my wife, hopefully. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? They're gonna say that. Now, all of a sudden, every man in that room is relieved of that tension, and they say, well, that's not me, forget it. So this doesn't relate to me. I don't have to deal with my own unconscious misogyny. But if I don't hit her, and I love the hell out of her, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm using misogyny in a way that's clueless, which is how usually it happens, and men start looking at it, and they start saying, oh man, God, he really reminds me of me. <laughs> then all of a sudden, that's a, that is a fader. And that is something that I take very seriously. And, and, and A, I care a lot about it, and I know a lot about it, um, but, but I knew that. I, and I said that to Jay, I said that to the director before, you know, I got that an offer and I told him, I was like, I don't wanna like hit her. Like, I don't wanna like, if we go down that road, we're, we're, it's gonna crash and burn. So um, that's how I think those, and I do think it's that small. Stewie Husseini. I and 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 Jesse, I we wanted him to be an Iranian name. I wanted it to be Iranian. I even gave him like three options how he could be Iranian. And I said I never want to talk about it. I never want to talk about this on the show. And he's like, we shouldn't, because right now there are so many Iranians that are owning Silicon Valley that you don't know about. <laughs> and and unless you see me as a person at that level, then you're never, so it's small stuff. So I think, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, one more, because um, we have a heart out. It's 4.30 now. Okay, two more. He's, he's, got, he's, he's getting picked up to go work. <laughs> yeah. He shoved us in today, and we, oh, we appreciate it. So, okay, go. Um, hi, my name is Salorm. Um, so, I'm paraphrasing here, but you mentioned how um, it's, um, it's, it has to be somebody's job to tell a story. Um, and I thought about um, Anthony Bourdain and his episode in Iran. Um, and it's like, it was during a time where like, there was like a lot of tensions between um, like Washington and Tehran. Um, and he goes um, to Iran and it's like a completely like different atmosphere than like what, um, what was being portrayed in the news. So my question is, um, you can tell a story, but how do you make people listen? How do you get people to listen to this story? Great question. Um, great question. The, the reality is Anthony Bourdain's show, and I know the episode, every Iranian in this room knows that episode, um, that he was a master of that show. He had his 10,000 hours, he knew how to make food, he knew how to like tell a story in that way. And because of that, and because of his genius of that show, we watched that show. Again, it, it's not an on-off switch, it's a fader. So the more of those stories, 
more yeses to those stories, more people that have excelled in those stories to tell those stories, more, um, if I were an executive, more marketing dollars to put that story out there. Um, again, it's a, you know, it's big. Um, but the reality is, everybody has a story here that's really powerful, meaningful, and I'm sure will bring us all to tears. And we would love to all of a sudden join on your GoFundMe or your families. I'm sure of it. But it takes small depth, go in. You saw that episode. You know, sharing that episode is a part of the movement. And I know we want it to be, why isn't this Beyonce level <laughs> reach? But again, it takes time. It takes a little bit of movement. And so my hope is that the opposite doesn't happen. Oh, no one wants to see those stories. So why are we doing those stories? This happens in the theater all the time. What happens is every, it just happened after, you know, and with, you know, all the shit that would happen, went down. They, all of a sudden there was a flush of like stories that we're gonna tell these black and brown stories on Broadway and off Broadway. And a few of them didn't, weren't su successful. Just like all Broadway shows, by the way. But all of a sudden it's like, well, we can't do that anymore. Because. Yeah. The minute I saw that first season after the pandemic, I thought, oh, well, they're setting us up. Because nobody's going to come to the theater. Now they're like, the well, theater, you well, saw see, it. It didn't, didn't work. It didn't work. It's like, yo, dude, half of your shows don't work. What are you talking about? So the, the hope is, is that we don't lose steam because the story hasn't reached the level that we all want it to. Again, the Beyonce level that we want it to reach at. Um, it's just to keep going forward. One more. All right, one more. Hi, this has been wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm an actress and a writer. And um, years ago, when I was teaching acting in public housing, I came and overheard a conversation where one of the um, teachers had gone out to get pizza for the end of the semester. And they pulled one of those, I'll bump into you, and then get angry and shot him dead. I did not know the young man, I just heard the story, and it was so visceral, a piece came out of it. Um, it's all in rhyme, and um, I've had it for a while, and I kept saying I can't sit on it. So um, it's a piece, of course, about nonviolence and, and, and guns. And I wanted to ask your advice about places that I could go to to present the piece or even funding. At this particular time, it's only for actors, okay? And I made myself one so I don't have to pay myself. <laughs> you should um, get paid. <laughs> but um, so at this point, I've put Quit. some monies away to, to say, okay, I'll produce it for a while. But I really, I really, it's in, in the, 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 um, the way it's written is extremely unusual, okay? And it grabs everyone who's read it. What advice do you have for me in terms of seeking money, number one, um, but most importantly, of venues? That's what I'm looking at. I'm going online and whatever, yeah. but I, yeah. yeah. I hear you. Two things I want to say to that. The answer to your question, FYI, we had a development meeting yesterday where we were asking the same questions <laughs> of like, where do we get money for this show? Um, so, so know that the, the hunt is everywhere. With regards to that first thing, I don't, I'm standing up here, maybe I'm saying the word I a lot, maybe me, I hope I'm not, but if I am, you should remove that immediately. I am one human being in an organization that really is doing a, a, the vast majority of this work. I say that to say that community is a thing that we have lost sight of. How do you want to make that play happen? You, I would immediately suggest who are the partners, actors, directors, community organizers, Brady Center, um, um, moms, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember all of the, you know, but all of the, um, every town, who are the organizations that would actually benefit from those things and to have a piece of art? And I would go to them immediately. After having a group of people that are in, that are like invested in this, 
When I say that, that's very important because I'm I have no idea about your piece or you or anything, and I mean no. But I say this a lot because sometimes I hear like, "Well, I'm doing it either way." Well, amazing. You can do it all yourself if you want, but unless you have a community of people that are going to see it, give a shit about it, want to back you, it won't matter. You're you're. And, and I say that because artists sometimes, our egos, myself included, get too much. And it's like, well, I'm doing this either way. And, and, and you have to build that community. That's the second thing, venues. We are living in a world right now where venues, especially after the pandemic, and, and as a theater producer here in the city that knows Broadway very well, knows the ins and outs, all the things, venue is so hard. I, I say this to everyone in this room, we have to remove I, idea that theater has to be done, theater with lights and all this. It could be done right here. It should be done right here. We did the courtroom. Everywhere. Everywhere. And, and, the, and, 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 and we did it at Cooper Union, and 2,000 people showed, or whatever, I don't even know. We did it at Hudson, we're, we're, you know, we did all these. Judson, Ch Judson Church, excuse me, Judson Church, and it kept, we kept on adding rows. It wasn't a proper theater, but I will tell you, many people think of that as a massively you know, beautiful night at the theater. Um, so I say, remove this tension of venue. And I'll say this, you keep building it, and you see perform it here and there and everywhere else. If, they real, if it's to be made, it will go to a theater. How? Because eventually someone will be like, let me put this in a theater. <laughs> That's just, just, just as simple as that. Really, it's as simple as that. Um, and I don't mean to cop out and not give you like direct answers, um, but the reality is that's kind of how this engine moves. Arun, thank you. Love you. Thank you for saying yes. Thank you for making <laughs> thank time. Oh, <you> <laughs> come on. Thank you guys for being here. Thanks a thank lot. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you for asking this. <laughs>